You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Giro d'Italia, supported by Science in Sport. Today we are in Rizul. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I am with Daniel Freib. Hello, Richard. What a humdinger of a stage, just when you thought it was safe to go in the water. What? It's a reference to the shark. To the shark. shark. That's attack. coming later. That's coming the sh- later. The shark attack. I was expecting. Yeah, but today's stage was all about a shark attack. Vincenzo oh, Nibali won it. very true. Shall we go we straight were... to the tail of the tapa? There's so much to talk about. Okay, let's, not let's to be confused with. with the shark's tail, which is coming later, and it's going to be an absolute crackerjack of an instalment. <laughs> Great. Look forward to that. Here is Lionel Burney with his tail of the tapa. Over to you, Lionel. Hello, Richard and Daniel. I hope you've had a nice, relaxing day in the French Alps. I'm talking to you from outside the Battersea Arts Centre near Clapham Junction in South London. I'm here because I'm going to watch a play shortly. It's called Von Tu and it tells the story of the duel between Marco Pantani and Lance Armstrong in the 2000 Tour de France. And I'm here because I'm making an episode for Friends of the Podcast about Mon Von Tu, its myth and its magic. And that will be released in early July, shortly before the tour goes to Mon Von Tu, um, around about midway through the race. Anyway, earlier on this afternoon, I was at the Rafa Cafe in central London watching the Giro on TV. I met up there with Ellis Bacon, a good friend and colleague of ours who's currently living in Melbourne. He's over visiting at the moment, says hello to everybody. Uh, and what a stage it was. N- stage number 19 from Pinarolo to Rizul in the French Alps, 162 kilometres with the Colle del Agnello at 2,700 metres, the highest point in the race. This has been a really good Giro, but today's stage was Grand Tour racing at its best, proving that misfortune plays as much a part in determining the winner over three weeks as anything else. And misfortune really befell Stephen Krauswijk, the Dutchman who was leading this morning by three minutes. It looked a healthy advantage, even with two very tough mounted stages to come, but he crashed on the descent of the Agnello. Fortunately, a bank of snow broke his fall, and although it was disastrous for his defence of the pink jersey, it could have been worse. Krauswijk had to change bikes, and as a result, he lost time going down the mountain. Also on that descent, Katusa's Ilnur Zakurin, who was fifth overall this morning, crashed and he came off a lot worse. He reportedly suffered a broken collarbone and is out of the race. Krauswijk was left to chase a group containing Vincenzo Nibali and Esteban Chavez, who was second overall this morning. Krauswijk chased all the way down the descent and then up the final climb. He received a bit of help from Etik's quick steps, Bob Jungles, but the pink jersey was slipping away. And there were some cruel moments where the man on the motorbike with the chalkboard showed him the damage that was being done as that pink jersey transferred over to Esteban Chavez. Up front, the Nibali and Chavez group caught all of the riders who'd been part of the earlier 28-man break, and then Nibali attacked to pull off a memorable stage win. It was a good day for Astana all round because not only did Nibali take the stage, but he moved up to second overall, just 40 seconds behind Chavez. And Nibali's teammate, Michele Scarponi, had also taken the Chima Copy Prize, reaching the top of the Agnello first. So the Colombian Esteban Chavez is now in pink, ahead of Nibali and Krauswijk, who has slipped to third, 105 behind the lead. The Dutchman has admitted his chances of victory have pretty much gone. And his place on the podium is also under threat because Alejandra Valverde is fourth, just 43 seconds back. And there's another massive mountain stage tomorrow. So Chavez is in pink, but all the other jerseys remain the same. Nizolo's in red, Cunigo's in blue, and Bob Jungles is in white. Over to you. Thank you for that, Lionel. And what a tapa it was, eh? Did you see that coming, Daniel? The race has been turned on its head. No, we've seen Nibali turn races on their heads before, haven't we? And we know that he has formidable bounce-back ability, that noun that we all love that has been coined in sport in recent years and we saw it at the Tour de France last year just when you thought that he was down and out back he came um, Rasputin like isn't he he refuses to die and um, I erroneously stated yesterday that he won the last time a major tour was at well came to Rizal um, in the 2014 Tour de France. In fact, he didn't win at Rizal. He won the day before at Chamrousse. But it was the kind of climb that he likes, wasn't it? Um, not too steep, quite rolling, and, you know, long descent off the Agnello. It was set up for Nibali, really, wasn't it? Well, you you apologising for that mistake, Daniel. I think you've got another mistake to apologise for as well. Would you like to 
no, no, issue, no, issue, no, issue, no, issue an apology. No, no. Um, I I stand by what I said yesterday. That it was always going to be a lottery to send guys down the road, and uh, you know, hope that the leader was going to bridge up to them. That's what happened. Astana were able to ping a couple of guys down the road, and Nibali benefited from a bit of drafting didn't he at some point on the Agnello and in the valley um, it kind of worked well, out Michele well Scarponi for them but and Scarponi was actually and, or- ordered and to it, sit up and wait and in fairness Richard Lotto and El Yumbo inexplicably once that once the, the tone had been set and once Movistar and Astana had shown that that was the tactic they were going to employ and also Orica Greenwich Lotto Yumbo really had to follow suit because you know we've talked about the weakness of their team in the mountains and you know they've got five six riders in that team who are basically going to be useless high up on the Agnello you know that in advance the only way to make them useful in those circumstances was to send them down the road once Astana uh-huh. once Astana and Movistar had decided to employ that tactic but otherwise um, not <laughs> <laughs> or or as, as one uh, journalist uh, said today as, as we watched the desperate Kreuzwick uh, chase to get back on He's got to get his checkbook out now, this journalist. Well, that was exactly what I was thinking. I mean, you... And and that was you you that said it. Oh, okay. I think I said wallet. But, um, (laughs) yes, I was was being very glib for Seychelles. Of course, I don't mean that. Of course, you know, when you're isolated and you're riding for the Giro d'Italia, you don't, you know, start having quiet words in the ears of Calling riders yeah riders on opposing teams that's never happened before in the Giro and I'm sure it would not have happened today well it might well happen tomorrow Daniel because Esteban Chavez who's now in the pink jersey with a slender lead because and this maybe will be overlooked in all the drama of today but Chavez also cracked a little bit close to the summit he lost a lot of time on Nibali in a pretty short uh, bit of road you know so it it all sets things up very nicely for tomorrow because he is only 44 seconds clear of Vincenzo Nibali in his press conference he was asked about a comment that Rigoberto Uran his fellow Colombian made Uh, he rides for the Cannondale team of course and Uran said explicitly that he will help Chavez if the opportunity arises tomorrow and to which Chavez said well Rigo is a great mate that would be wonderful thank you very much and it, it could be that he needs an ally another guy who was up there today Georg Preidler or Peddler de Charme a few days ago is apparently joining Orica Green Edge next year and he's very strong in the claims and you know these things can can count absolutely for something, I mean I half jokingly there made well suggested that favours won't be called in tomorrow however we have seen that exactly that kind of favour be decisive on final mountain stage of a Giro in the not too distant past in 2005 Giro d'Italia I don't know if you remember this Richard not too far from here Sestriere um, Paolo Savaldelli Gilberto Simone and Jose Rujano were duking it out there for the final pink jersey and Wim van Huffel um, who, which is a name it's that a most name to conjure with. It's a, a name to conjure with, and a name that most people will have forgotten. But Wim van Huffel did a sterling turn there for Paolo Savaldelli and was probably key in winning the Giro for Savaldelli. Look who it is! Look who it is! The man, the busiest man in Rizul. It's Ciro Scognamilio. Hello, Ciro. Hello, listeners. Never busy for you. You, you look very stressed out, Ciro. This is ah, really? all your oh, okay. Christmases have come at once here. Uh, not not re- really. No, not really, because uh, my idea of uh, Christmas, dear Richard, is not to spend uh, uh, Christmas between these uh, mountains. Uh, I have I, I have a lot of words for these mountains, but it's better maybe not to say to our listener, otherwise kids couldn't listen to you. you know? <laughs> okay, uh, tell us, uh, Chiro, you, you were in the press conference with Nibli. He talked about, you know, these climbs, ironically, we're in France, but these roads, these climbs suit him much better than the shorter ramps of the Dolomites in his native Italy, he said. And he, he certainly performed well. But what, what's the secret? What's, what's, been the, what's been the key to his turnaround? Uh, maybe it's difficult to find only one key, but uh, maybe after, well, he was fourth this morning, and maybe he felt that he had nothing to lose in this stage, and certainly the fact that the Pink Jersey Cruise Week uh, got 
dropped certainly gave him a kind of extra motivation. Moreover, he remembered really well this climb because this climb was made, was made also in the Tour of 2014 when he won the Tour. Mike won the stage, if I'm not wrong, he arrived second or immediately end. He also remembered really well this, uh, this climb. So now, Giro completely over. A problem for me, but not for everyone. So. Is he going to win it? D difficult to say. 50-50, um, maybe? Mm, interesting. We were talking there before you appeared about Chavez maybe having some allies out there in likes of Rigoberto Uran, maybe Gor Georg Preidler as well. Who knows? Because he's rumored to be going to Aura Cup. But yes, also maybe Rigoberto Uran, if I'm not wrong, uh, say today that yes. uh, he would have. Uh, Maybe he could uh, could help uh, Chavez uh, tomorrow in the decisive stage. At least I think that certainly also Nibali got a great effort um, today. So maybe Chavez for the overall is has a little advantage, but little. I mean, the stage tomorrow will be really open. I think we should hear from some of the key characters from today's stage, shouldn't we, Richard? Who are we going to hear from first, Daniel? Because you had a few conversations. Uh on your way back to the press room. Well, who's in charge here, Richard? It's you, isn't it? Well, there were a few options, Daniel. You got, came out with such great material from us. Uh, Matt White, we got Joe Dombrowski let's shouting to Matt from his White. hotel let's room. Let's go to Matt White, Matt shall White, we? Look, direct, look, let's go to Matt White. Direct, right, yeah, and well, then we'll, we'll explain a little challenge that we're going to set for the last couple of days. Matt White, direct sportif, Orica Green Edge. Another boring day on the Giro, Matt White. Not a boring day indeed. No, it was... Look, at a stage like that with those profiles, we always had the potential to uh, turn into a very exciting day and live up to it, live, live up to his expectations. And how are you personally getting through this year? Because it's been a bit of a an emotional roller coaster, hasn't it? And it's not over yet. Oh, not over yet. It's uh, far from over, man. Tomorrow is uh, going to be the biggest uh, the biggest day in a lot of our guys' lives. Tomorrow, yeah. it's uh, a big mountain stage, but I've really enjoyed it. It's uh, you know, when a rider comes in and performs above expectations it's uh it gives everyone a lot of confidence and esteban certainly performed uh you know, at an incredible level and he's got one very very important day to go and when you imagine the stage this morning you'd obviously thought about it a lot how did the reality and your idea your you know the theory about the stage match up exactly as we thought that's why we uh that's why we put rubens Plaza in the breakaway we knew that people would we didn't know who would do it whether it was a star or a movie star or us we, we wanted to Someone had to test guys, and when uh, when we tested, we saw some weaknesses in a few of the GC guys, and they went on with it. So we always wanted someone up in front so we could call them back and work through the valley. Like what happened the other day, Rubens Plaza ran an incredible ride, and uh, look, the, the Valverde group came within 10 seconds at one stage of catching. Now, if they'd caught them, maybe we'd have a different result. But because uh, the Valverde group had to work all the way through the valley, the four of them, where Nibali and Esteban sat on the wheels the whole valley, that was the difference. That was the difference at the end on the last climb. And look, Vincenzo, Vincenzo had a very, very strong climb and uh, he's uh, obviously the guy we have to watch tomorrow. I mean, it was such a hard stage today. Was there any question, can a rider like Esteban on a day like today think at all about tomorrow's stage and think, right, I don't want to go too deep here because we know what's coming tomorrow? Well, you've got to ride intelligently and riding intelligently means not blowing up and you've got, to, you've got to ride measured and measured for what you're trying to achieve. Once, once we knew Cruisewick was in trouble, we tried to measure the event as good as we could against Nibali, but uh, he proved uh, he, was, he was strong today. Esteban did a lot of work at the bottom of the climb, and uh, we've got one more day to defend and one, one wire to watch. And just lastly, Matt, I thought about your plan for today's stage. I mean, we're talking now about half an hour or an hour after the finish. Have you already got a plan for tomorrow? Are you already thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow? Mate, I've been thinking about it for about six months. But obviously we're in a different situation than uh, what we could have dreamt of being in. But uh, look, I know what other teams' plans are as well. So, of course, people are going to put us under pressure on the first climb. Whether it was Cruisewick in the jersey, whether it was us in the jersey, it wouldn't matter. For sure, Movie Star and, and Astana, they will try it. The first climb of the day, for sure they're going to go. They're going to try to isolate our guys. It's, uh, it's not rocket science. Our guys have got a big job tomorrow, and, uh, and we're looking forward to it. Eurosport, the home of cycling.
Thank you to Eurosport for sponsoring our daily Peddler de Charme Award. We're failing miserably yet again. We had to wait in our hotel this morning to get our passports back, didn't we, Daniel? So we, we did, we did. But you hear there, Rich, Matt White said that he knew exactly what was going to happen today and he knew exactly, he knows exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. Extraordinary yep. clairvoyance. Well, that's almost uh, on a par with our friend Chiro. Chiro, do you have to rush off? You look like, you look anxious. Not really. I could remain also other two minutes, but I have a lot of problems for tonight, Richard, and dear listener, and maybe it's good that uh, our listeners know that I have these problems. For example, a lot of articles to write, a restaurant to find tonight. It's not obvious here in Resort because everything is closed. But, uh, but I mean, I have good stuff also uh, in Newspapers Gazetta. I can anticipate maybe one thing to our listener or not. Yes, I don't know. Do, it's not It's not Quinciato's Buddhism thing again, is it? Not Quinciato Buddhism, not a new tattoo of Daniel Os. I had a really good conversation immediately after the stage with Shark's father, Salvatore Nibali. The, <laughs> the, the wolf is here in France. The, what a provocation. Not, no, he's not oh. here. But he found me from Messina. Oh. He found me. And... Uh, the I wolf have, of Messina. The wolf of Messina, and I have an ex- an exclusive chat with him on Gazeta Tomorrow edition, paper edition. Listen. Did he say anything interesting? What did he say? Well, uh, he was really. Um, I mean, he was crying in a certain way. After. Well, Vincenzo was very uh, emotional at the finish, also, wasn't he? Also, his father, and uh, he told me a story linked to the fact the the death of the young uh, mm. guy Rosario, uh, the, the young guy that was a member of the junior team uh, dedicated to Nibali, mm. and so it has been really tough but interesting. He so, died a couple of weeks ago, didn't he? Exactly, exactly during a, t- a training in. Uh, in Messina while he was on his bike and so uh, the wolf uh, told me something about this really really tough really emotional so I will uh, write also about this on Gazeta tomorrow well, somebody suggested that they might have sneaked the wolf into France in, in sheep's clothing. Somebody, a very witty well, comment on Twitter. Well, we did go over the Colle de l'Agnello, the lamb's pass, literally translated earlier. Mm, mm. Well, Chiro, you, and we know you've got to run. Yes, thank you. But I, I, I not, I'm noticing this. So, I mean, we are in cycling or we are in a zoo? Because we are, every day we talk about shark, about lamb. About wolf. About peacock, don't forget the peacock. I mean, the peacock is the first animal for me. So maybe, I, I don't know where we are. Also, this is my question. Maybe in a zoo, but not in Berlin, but in Rizul. Thanks, Chiro. He's off, he's off, he's off. Walking rapidly back towards <laughs> With a big smile on his face. I can see yeah. his reflection in the window, <laughs> smiling to himself. He's yeah, pleased with that. Yeah, I think he plans these things. Um, Daniel, I think you also spoke to Nibali's coach, Paolo Slongo, at the finish. Well, I did. There's been a lot of talk about Nibali's health and whether mm. he's suffering from a virus and Astana sent him off to get some tests done a couple of nights ago and we learned this morning that the test results had come back and they were all clear. Um, Slongo talked to me a bit about that. He also talked to me about the criticism that Nibali thinks he's been receiving over the past few days and also the criticism that Slongo has been subject to as his coach. And We talked there about how emotional Nibali can be and Slongo here, speaking to me at the finish, revealed a sort of more sensitive side to Nibali than the one we're used to seeing and and talks really about his vulnerability to that criticism and to the expectations that he's felt at this Giro d'Italia. I would be lying if I said we hadn't doubted. Deep down though, I was always confident because our build-up to this race had been perfect. Today, a glimmer of light has opened up, but we have to keep our feet on the ground. Chavez is 40 seconds ahead. Kreiswek is still third. We still have to be careful. Getting his test results back, getting the all clear, may have been one of those things that made Vincenzo think positively again. That said, it's not as though a rider, and certainly not Vincenzo, would be looking at his blood values or anything like that. 
not in the third week. We only really wanted to see whether he had a virus, which he hasn't. We did the tests, first of all, because riders have to get them done every three months. And we thought we may as well do them now, rather than inconvenience Vincenzo when he's at home. Until the Dolomites, when I'd analysed the data after stages, the numbers were always in a normal range for Vincenzo. Then we had three days when he just couldn't push the pedals, so we started to question everything from his preparation to his massages to his osteopathy treatment. It's also normal that there's a psychological effect when you're under so much pressure to win and when the media are on your back. I've also been criticised, not just for his training, but also this decision to use longer pedal cranks. It's obvious that all of this creates stress, but Vincenzo and the team have dealt with it really well. They've reacted perfectly. We also said to him that he had nothing to prove to us. The pressure may definitely have been a factor though. I always give an example to illustrate this point. Here, he's almost had more support than when he's been winning in the past. Banners, encouragement, all sorts. But his character is such that if one million people compliment him and just one shout something negative, he'll focus on that and then get stuck. Overall though, we're happy with the way that today's gone and we'll try again to blow the race apart and get the pink jersey tomorrow. You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Giro d'Italia, supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science and Sport for sponsoring us at this Giro d'Italia. You can get 20% off all Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com. And at the checkout, enter the code SIS20. That's SIS20. 20% off. Thank you very much indeed to them. Without them, we wouldn't be here, would we, Daniel? Uh, enjoying this wonderful Giro. What's what's actually what's just a Giro that's just caught fire with a couple of days to go. Now, we heard there from Paolo Slongo, the coach of Vincenzo Nibali said one or two interesting things. I'm still very dubious about the this um, you know the health problems and the, the tests that he had. But we chatted about it a wee bit in the car, didn't we, Daniel? And you suggested that you know even if there was nothing wrong with him in the first place, getting the all clear might have just cl- clicked something in his head, turned something in his head. Well, Slonger half agreed with that, and he certainly thinks or has thought up until now that Nibali's problems have been mainly mental um, he has suffered under the weight of expectation and obviously today for whatever reason he was able to unburden himself of those expectations the pressure and it was the Nibali of Olden his team was vital again uh, you know we, we started this year really talking about the relative strength of Nibali's team as compared with Crowswick, well very early in the year we were talking about this and also compared to Chavez's team although Chavez in the mountains has been able to count on two riders who have really surpassed them surpassed themselves Ruben Plaza and Damien House and, and Plaza was certainly vital today um, Crowswick unfortunately it's it's a different story um, you know we had our little tactical ding dong last night Richard about how to use how to best use teammates and certainly I don't think we we could possibly disagree that Lotto Jumbo had an absolute stinker today yeah I should point out that we've moved locations since the last segment we've moved to a, a bar it's quite a small but lively crowd boisterous. I would say quite boisterous um, yeah some people volunteering to come on the podcast who I don't think are really in a fit state to be on the podcast a bit like me when I had that nine and a half percent beer way back in uh, Chianti I think that was anyway um yes it was uh, yeah Crowswick well the big story with him today was a crash we should also before we talk about that and, and the ethics of what happened in the aftermath of his crash also mentioned Ilner Zakarin um we had a big package lined up for tonight on Zakarin I did a long interview with Vyacheslav Ekimov his director yesterday and it was really interesting on Zacharine and on this this came about because Zacharine refused me an interview once again he just seems very shy and not confident enough in his English Ekimov told me just fascinating stuff about his background and you know he's a, he's, a, he's a Muslim in a part of Russia the Republic of Tatarstan where the majority of the population are Muslim and 
that was all very interesting. That was going to be a, quite a big part of tonight's show because I thought that Zach Green would, would figure quite prominently, and he did figure prominently, but unfortunately, lying on his back he figured several yards in the from the road. Drift, didn't he? Unfortunately, well, he had a nasty crash. And joking apart, because he seems to be okay, it looked really bad. It was one of those moments where where he went. It's like a foot, when you see a footballer go down and stay down, and you you can sort of get a sense that something that people around him are worried. That was the sense. I had watching people gather around him and he wasn't moving and he's been taken to hospital. Uh, he's out of the race, obviously. A broken collarbone is apparently the verdict. He has been taken to hospital, as has Stephen Crowswick. Yes. This evening yes. we've just learned. Um, as you say, Richard, he did come down on the Agnello, on the descent of the Agnello. Not a particularly difficult descent. And, ha, well, uh, Daniel... Uh, well, it's known known for his descending skills. Well, it's not a particularly difficult descent. I mean, it's a it's a pretty straight road. It's one of those passes, like most of the passes that cross the Franco-Italian border, they tend to kind of go arrow straight up to uh, four or five or six kilometers short of the border, and then they start climbing hairpins. And it was quite a straight section. Yeah. I mean, it was a, a, a gentle curve where there, there Croswick may, there fell. May, who knows? There may have been a spot of ice just by the snowdrift, perhaps. We don't know. He did overcook it. Chavez said an interesting thing afterwards. He said that Nibali, he said it wasn't easy to follow Nibali on the descent. He's crazy on the descent. He said, but so must I because I followed him. Nibali was putting the pressure down there. Well, And this is the big debate, isn't it? And sadly, I don't think we're going to disagree on this. Did the others do the right thing by pressing on? Absolutely, 100%. Particularly as you said there that Nibali had put the pressure on. And, and this is an an acknowledged tactic. I mean, when we think about the great descenders, we think about their ability to drop people on descents. And we've seen Nibali win races by attacking on descents before. We've seen Samuel Sanchez in recent history, even Valverde, various other riders. But one key skill when you are a good descender is the ability to put people under pressure. And this was this is a tactic that, for example, Eddie Merckx used a great deal late in his career as he felt his strength dwindling and he was no longer able to drop people on the way up climbs very frequently he would attack right at the top of climbs or start to put the pressure on literally as they crested the summit and descend very fast and and there is a school of thought that that was what put Louis Ocaña out of the 1971 Tour de France and you know I'm not suggesting that was on Nibali's mind really when he was putting the pressure on, but there's always a possibility that you will force someone else into a mistake. There's a paradox there, isn't there? We talk about Nibali's vulnerability um, and writers who are vulnerable, perhaps fragile mentally, it's often because they over, overthink things and he has ability to not overthink. And I think on a descent that that's particularly uh, a common phenomenon. Uh, you know, if you start thinking about it, you're, you're in danger. You're now, it was a very heavy fall. I mean, he went straight into the snowdrift, Croswick, and hit it very hard, went right over. And, you know, as you say, he's been taken to the hospital. He's obviously hurt. That probably cost him a bit. He put up a, a very admirable defence for a long time. He held it, he held it, he held it. One of him against Scarponi, Nibali, Chavez, Rubens Plaza. It was a, a really great effort. He paid for a bit on the final climb. He was dropped by Bob Jungels up there. He did well to limit his losses as much as he did, but his 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 performance on the Agnello, where he matched Chavez and Nibali, suggested that you know had he not crashed and had he survived the descent, he would still be in the pink jersey. Yeah, I think he probably would. I'm not sure he was on a great day today. I mean, certainly speaking to the Dutch journalist, actually Nibali, journalists. Nibali, sorry, said that he th- he sensed on the Agnello that, that, that he was not on a good day. Yeah, I mean, speaking to some of the Dutch journalists who were watching Crowswick very closely and who know him very well, they say that on the Agnello he didn't look as smooth as he has done, or as he had done thus far in the Giro. And, and yesterday we also talked about his confidence, perhaps his overconfidence coming into today's stage and contrasted really, juxtaposed with... Various people who have said to us over the past couple of weeks that Kreuzwick, okay, he's going really well, but he always has a bad day in Grand Tours. And, um, you know, when people were saying that kind of thing, uh, I was sort of slightly sceptical because, okay, perhaps he does have bad days, but he's also got a very good record in the third week of races and he has a very good record of conserving his energy and riding economically. And I thought he would be fine. But then... 
You know, other question marks about Lotto, Jumbo, not only their tactics today, but w- was the whole camp, were the whole team feeling a little bit overconfident? I mean, announcing today that Giovanni Battaglin had... Not Giovanni. Giovanni, no, no relation. No relation. Uh, Enrico. Enrico Battaglin had renewed his contract with the team. They announced that in an official communique. Was that really necessary two days before the end of a Giro in which Battaglin still has a key role to play? I'm not entirely sure. Let's hear, shall we, because you spoke to Richard Pluger. Well, first of all, I should point out that Lotto Jumbo NL, Lotto NL Jumbo, Lotto NL Jumbo. I think I've been saying Lotto Jumbo NL all Giro. Is that wrong? It doesn't matter. It's you know, it's not Lotto Sudal. I'm slightly embarrassed now. Don't be. Daniel. Anyway, we all, make mis- we, all, we all make mistakes. Crowsworks team beat a fairly hasty retreat to their team hotel here in Rizal. They managed to, for the most part, avoid the waiting journalists, I think. And well, they, they were helped by the fact that their team bus was stuck at the bottom of the mountain by French policemen. Um, however, I had a, had a little jog over to where they're staying on the sort of outer fringes of the Rizal Resort. And I managed to find the team manager, Richard Plugger, who like the rest of the team and support staff, was in a pretty downbeat and unhappy mood. So yep. Richard, obviously a desperately disappointing day for you, but I suppose if there's any consolation, you're not out of it yet and Stephen could still come back and, and challenge again tomorrow. Uh, yeah, it, it depends. Uh, at this moment, we uh, we take a look at his, uh, his health, his body. Uh, we have to see where he's at. And, um, you know, after that, yes, then we have to... Uh, grab ourselves uh, together and uh, and uh, take a look at tomorrow but uh, of course it starts it starts with uh, I don't know he crashed pretty hard so um, yeah we have to see uh, that first at this point about an hour after the finish of the stage what do you know about the crash and his injuries I don't know any I just saw him uh, crashing like you do and uh, I didn't speak with him yet and uh, so we uh, we don't know we are checking him now and uh, the result is uh, later. Yeah. And, and do you think it's fairly likely that the the injuries that he sustained in the crash did have an impact on his performance? It seemed that way. I, uh, I think, yeah, of course, because it's, it was a hard crash, but uh, it didn't help uh, that he was alone, uh, you know, suddenly. Uh, he had to do all the work uh, before the start of the climb, um, which, of course, is also uh, not good to, uh, for a good performance on the climb. And just finally, knowing Stephen, how do you think he'll bounce back from this? Uh, normally, he's a he's he's a back bouncer. How do you say that? Um, but this is, of course, a big blow, and um, uh, he should. Uh, yeah, again, we should first take a look at his body, and then we uh, uh, will cry a little bit together, and then uh, uh, grab ourselves together and uh, and look at uh, at tomorrow. But it starts with the body. Okay, so that was Richard Pluger, very understandably disappointed. Uh, Richard Pluger, I don't see Kreuzwick recovering tomorrow from that. You know, whatever his injuries, his state of health is, uh, it was a bitter, bitter blow for him. We didn't really get into debate about the ethics of whether the guy should have carried on. Well, no, I mean, no, we're, I'm agreeing with you, Daniel, 100%. That, and, and, you know, Chavez was asked a lot afterwards about whether. There was a shadow on the pink jersey, whether there was should be some kind of asterisk, whether he should feel that he didn't uh, gain the pink jersey fairly. He dismissed that. I mean, you know, the, the Giro d'Italia is not ridden in a physiology lab. It's not about who's the strongest. It's about who negotiates the course in the best shortest bike time. Rider, yeah. I mean, uh, Chavez smiled throughout his press conference, as he tends to do. But, you know, he, he said, well, it's always journalists that ask questions like that. He, he did it all very charmingly. But, yeah, he, he slightly, slightly angered. I mean, I think he felt that he rode well to follow Nibali on the descent and, and keep stay with him. And uh, and Kroeswick made a mistake and paid a heavy price. And it was interesting talking to one of our colleagues in the press room the other day, uh, Matt Rendell, who's the author of a, a great book on Colombian climbers, Kings of the Mountains, who talks about Chavez. And he didn't exactly say that he's been the runt of the litter in this great Colombian generation, but he's certainly a rider who has been written off by various people over the years due to the fact that yeah, he might be. It, it, well, we talked about lab tests just a second ago, but in lab tests, he might not be 
as impressive as some others. He um, was considered too fragile, too this, too that. And here he is, um, really coming into his own and um, really also confounding a lot of the stereotypes about Colombian riders, you know, that they can't def- can't descend, that they're flaky, that, um, you know, they're mentally weak. And, and he has been the opposite of all of those things, hasn't he? Yeah, we, we has. We didn't mention, uh, after hearing from Matt White, his director, the the challenge that we're going to set ourselves, Daniel, over the, the next last couple of days, because Matt White, as several people have observed, begins every every response with, look, and I, I'm going to try and do an interview with Matt White where I begin every question with the word Luke. It might be Luke LeBlanc won around here, uh, won on this claim, you know, blah, blah, blah. What are your memories of that? Or just Luke in the more conventional sense. I'll, I'll think of Luke, Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader. Who's your favourite? Talking of conventional, the, the conventional and the unconventional, I did a very, very unconventional interview this evening, didn't I, Richard? You did. Let's, let's hear that. You were... Coming back to the press centre when you, you um, came across young Joe Dombrowski, our diarist at this Giro, and uh, you conducted an interview with him, shouting up at him From a distance on his of balcony. A, probably the longest distance. It's like Romeo and Juliet, isn't it? It, it was very much like that. I I'm not sure if a, an interview has ever been conducted from that Break, vertical. Breaking new ground. With such the altitude gain, if we want to talk in terms of altitude gain, which we often do at the Giro, the altitude gain in that interview was about 50 metres. Not 50 metres, wow. that's 50 nonsense. feet, I don't know. No, <laughs> it, was probably, it was more than 50 feet. Anyway. Right, okay, well, let's hear that. So apologies, it doesn't, it's quite difficult to hear right, what he's saying. Crank up the volume. Yeah, crank up the volume, um, but don't crank up too much, because immediately after that, we'll hear the latest little clip of from Joe Dombrowski's diary. He's keeping a diary for us throughout the Giro. It's really good stuff. He's been sending in clips every day he's doing interviews with teammates staff uh, and and generally musing on life at the Giro and that will be released as a friend special the week after the race finishes I think on the Friday become a friend at the cyclingpodcast.com it's 10 pounds for the year you get 11 special podcasts and you also support us year round because it helps to keep the show on the road and helps us to go to races importantly so the first sort of 10 seconds or so are Daniel shouting at Romeo shouting at Juliet and Juliet shouting back. And then we'll hear Joe Dombrowski on the subject of electronics. How your day went, Joe? Uh, what do you want to know? In two sentences, two sum sentences. up your day. Okay. Uh, very long time for the break to go. It was pretty hard. Uh, I was there on On Yellow. And then I just kind of blew up. Who's going to win the Giro? I'm going to say... Can I say who I want to win? Chavez. That, that's another thing, is... I think it's really important in a Grand Tour, in stage races in general, but it's more cumulative in a Grand Tour, to turn off the electronics yeah. after like 10, which is hard because especially like, you know, the Giro's for me, it's one of my biggest races this year. So all my friends are watching and following. So I always get texts and messages and, you know, like pictures that they saw me on TV or whatever right. from all my friends. And it's just, so, you know, like you're always engaging with people. And since we're six hours ahead, they're engaging at like midnight. Yeah, and that's when you turn on. Yeah, yeah, and it's like time for me to go to sleep. And uh, that combined with also just like the stress of the race, you know, like it's here, we're here with Rigo and he can win. So it's stressful because we have to make sure that he's safe all the time. And... You know, the stress of that, just cumulative fatigue, like by week three, most guys are so fatigued that it's actually pretty hard to sleep well. So I think turning off the devices and reading is what I've found to be the best thing. Because for me, it's like the difference between like, if I sit on my iPhone and talk to my friends at home, I could stay up till two in the morning doing that. But if I read, I usually fall asleep with a book on my face. That's good. So I think, and I think that adds up, you know, over time. We heard there from Joe Dombrowski. Um, 
we haven't done Pedal de Charme again, Daniel. Lots of uh, lots of nominations for Michele. We've got any t-shirts left. We've got one left, I think. We still owe Brambilla one, um, and several others. We've got we have a lot of nominations tonight for Michele Scarponi, but not sure about Michele <laughs> Scarponi. Why not? Controversial choice, isn't they? There have been a few controversial choices. Let's face it. I saw an amusing tweet today, actually, from uh, Neil Rogers, who was watching the the commentary with. Uh, I think Rob Hatch and Sean Kelly, and they couldn't remember whether Scarponi had been involved with Dr. Fuentes or Dr. Ferrari or both. Both. <laughs> yeah. I can emphatically say that he's been involved yeah. with both. That, yeah. So, yeah, I'd probably not give him Pedro de Charme, uh, although he did, pr- he did. it was a very selfless act. He maybe wasn't entirely happy about having to wait for Nibali, but he did. Anyway, we will think of somebody for Pedro de Charme, and, yeah. and we will maybe just give it to Brambila. Daniel, what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, Richard, tomorrow's stage, let's just open our road book and let's just turn to the page. It's stage 20 like from teacher. Gies to Santana di Vinadio. Very famous mineral water from Santana di Vinadio. It's, um, you often talk about jingles. There's a fantastic jingle on the end of the mineral water advert. Santana di Vinadio. Can you, anyway. do, this <laughs> in the, can you do this in the voice of Max Chiandri? Someone's asked on Twitter no. whether you can do your no, Max Chiandri no, no, impression. No, 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 no. Maybe another time. Anyway, we've got um, three more climbs. Well, four more climbs, in fact, over 2,000 metres. As, as if we haven't gone over 2,000 metres enough in this Giro d'Italia. We've got the Col de Vars, the Col de la Bonnette. Uh, and then we've got the Colle della Lombarda, and then we've got a small ramp, a two, about two kilometres, that climbs up to, well, 1.3 kilometres, that goes up to Santana di Vinaglio at the end. And it's steep, that final ramp, and I can see the Giro being decided there. Um, it, it will go right down to the death. Having said that, um, obviously a lot of focus tomorrow will be on the climbs themselves. The bonnet, of course, um, not the highest pass in Europe. I'm sure some people will call it the highest pass in Europe tomorrow, but it's not. Um, It's nearly the highest, but it's not. Um, Very hard climb, very long climb, very high climb. And then the Lombarda is similar. I think the descent of the Lombarda might also be crucial because it's complicated, it's twisty, it's gnarly. And uh, I think Vincenzo Nibli will be licking his lips. I think tomorrow's stage, the profile looks like shark's teeth. And I think that could be time for is a portion of things to come. La mia tecnica funzionò, nel senso che tornai ad essere lo squalo e non un fidanzatino triste vestito da ciclista. My technique worked in the sense that I went back to being the shark and not just a sad little boyfriend dressed up as a cyclist. So the shark's tail there, Daniel, another gripping installment of that. Wow. We might have... We might I'm not have even going to... I've even I've stopped trying to explain. I think the, yeah, the listeners explain. are so au fait now with the sort of subliminal messages oh, yeah. that are conveyed by the shark's tail that I don't even need to translate it for them. Absolutely not. No, I think everybody knows exactly where you're coming from. We're going to have to... We're talking today about what we're going to do for the tour, what we're going to have to be... You know, because I, I think... Based on the fact that tomorrow's stage looks like a shark's mouth, I think I think Nibley's going to do it. I think I think I see Nibley as the winner of this Giro now. Wow! Should I we think. hear from someone who probably understands cycling a bit better than us? <laughs> the Lampre Marie. Could be anybody. Could, Could be, be these drunk guys here in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Should we hear from the Lampre Marida team manager Brent Copeland? So Brent Copeland, manager of Lampre Marida. I've heard from a few of the people who are going to be fighting for victory tomorrow a few of their managers they've all got their ideas about how the stage is going to pan out what do you see happening tomorrow on the big stage to Santana di Vinadio? Well, I think like I said in the beginning uh, Nibili was my choice for, for the victory of the Giro uh, he went through a bad patch he was able to turn around in a big way today but I think he rode more with head and heart than he did with legs so I think his condition is still more or less where it was a few days ago. Um, he'll obviously try tomorrow, but it'll be difficult to shake 44 seconds off Chavez, so I think it'll come down to Chavez taking it. It's interesting you say that, Brent, about his condition, because it looked, certainly on TV pictures, that it was a different rider today, and he looked considerably stronger than he has done thus far in the Giro, but you don't think that there is much difference between how he's riding or how he rode today and you know how he was three or four days ago? Uh, no, looking at the steep part of the climb today, Chavez held his own and kept pretty much at the same distance. As soon as the climb uh, eased off a bit, and we know what this climb is like, it's not a really difficult climb, 
there he managed to put time into Chavez. Tomorrow the climb is going to be more difficult, so it will be more to Chavez's advantage. And is Kreswick out of it? Uh, I think so, yeah, unfortunately. Obviously it depends on how he's feeling after the crash and they'll have to get news of, of how his real condition is. But looking at how it went today, it looks that way. So it's Brent Copeland, the general manager at Lamprey Merida. Yes, Richard, and he thinks Crows works out of it. He thinks that Chavez showed again today that he's the best rider on the steep climbs. Tomorrow's climbs are steeper um, in the main than the final climbs of Rizal today. So Brent um, is, well, having said that, he he tipped Nibali at the start of the Giro, and he's certainly not counting Nibali out. Mm. You know, I mean, it, it is a fascinating GC Valverde. We've not talked about him at all today. He, he has a bit of a, a bit of a bad day, but he's not that far down, is he? Overall, Valverde, he's not that far away. He doesn't look good. I mean, he doesn't look like he's in great form. It's between Chavez and Nibali. I, I would wager, and my money's on Nibali. What do you think, Daniel? Well. Unfortunately, Richard, my money was on Stephen Kreuzweig <laughs> to the tune of 125 to 1. <laughs> Most oh, unfortunate. I thought you were a bit downbeat today. That stung. It did sting. <laughs> oh, dear. That's terrible. You should have cashed it in a few days ago like you were going to do. And I, I think I talked you out of that, did I? Yeah, you and various other people on Twitter. So thanks to my Twitter followers for persuading me it was a good idea to stay on him and he was going to definitely win the Giro. <laughs> oh, well, never mind. Eh? Um, who is going to win, Daniel? I think Chavez. I think with it, you know, I've gone on about it every day pretty much about the altitude and I, tomorrow we go very high again and I think that's going to be key for Chavez and I think he's going to he's going to do it. A confident Nibali, though, is a rampaging Nibali, and we're going to see a different Nibali tomorrow. Yeah, and I think we should probably also say all credit to Nibali for really putting on a show until the very last, whatever the result tomorrow. Um, you know, we've we've had various discussions about him over the last two or three years, whether he is or he isn't charismatic, and you know what kind of mark he's going to leave on professional cycling, but. Um, he has been fantastic entertainment yet again today, and as he as he often is. And um, you know, even last year in the Tour de France when he won at La Tour it's a it was a memorable performance, something that people will talk about for years to come. And today's stage was certainly something that people will remember. I think, um, yeah, I think I think his attitude today was that it was a consolation prize. I think I think that the fact that he's back in the overall reckoning has surprised e even him. Um, he was asked afterwards whether that was his most beautiful win. He said, no, Il Lombardia last year was his most beautiful win. In fact, he rejected outright the suggestion that today was, final word, Daniel, we're in France. I don't think we're entirely happy about that, are we? You were muttering No, I mean, to me, it's a bit like the Olympics is to football. France doesn't really need the Giro d'Italia. It doesn't really appreciate the Giro d'Italia. And the crowds were thinner, weren't the they? The crowds Much were thinner. very poor. We're in a completely deserted resort, the local... Bar and restaurant owners haven't even bothered opening up for the, the event. The policemen aren't as nice. The policemen definitely aren't as nice they and definitely not as deferential to us in our Ma Maserati. Yeah, I know. Maserati in, in Italy is, is amazing. We've talked a lot about because we have been kindly lent a Maserati by Maserati. And we drive past little groups of kids and they start shouting Maserati, don't Maserati, they? Maserati, Maserati. Yeah, we yeah, keep meaning yeah. to record that. And yeah. we haven't. Tomorrow, tomorrow's our last chance, maybe. Yeah. Must do that. Must remember to do that. Anyway, that's all for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with the latest installment. We should know tomorrow night who's going to win the Giro, although it could still be very, very close. It's set up for a worth thriller, isn't Worth just saying, it? Richard, worth just saying while we're at it and while we're talking about this, about how close it might be tomorrow, it is difficult to envisage any kind of racing whatsoever happening on Sunday, Sunday. isn't it? I mean, there is... There is one climb on, well, not too far from the finish, actually. Um, there's a little rise called the, well, it's the Villa de la Regina climb. And it is just under a kilometre long and a maximum We've percentage of... talk about tomorrow. Maximum percentage of 8%. Um, you know, seven kilometres from the finish. In theory, someone could po possibly do something there um, but I think it's more like it's going to finish in a sprint ok it? well let's wait and see shall we we'll be back tomorrow in the meantime thank you very much Daniel thank you Richard <laughs>